So let me dive in. As many of you may have heard the news, as we heard in the U.S., the U.K. and its leadership was in significant trouble uh, in, in recent weeks for having spent 37 billion, that is with a B, 37 billion pounds on a test and taste strategy that among other decisions uh, was considered to be an abysmal and unsuccessful failure of governance in the UK that not only didn't work, but was actively counterproductive. In the United States, we have significant challenges now with our public health authorities and the guidance that they continue to issue. Every day it changes and it's more and more confusing with lots of contradictions and many accusations that our public health authorities are lying to us. For example, shortening quarantine times, uh, uh, making recommendations against testing, simply because we don't have enough access to tests in this country. Whatever the underlying rationale, there is tremendous confusion and people are very unhappy about the public health guidance. During the pandemic, we also saw in the United States, as around the world, how there were such significant challenges of government response. The governors in the United States spent only in the first four months of the pandemic, they spent $100 million on the consulting firm McKinsey in an effort to try to shore up the deficits of leadership that people felt government was suffering from. So there is no wonder a considerable lack of trust, especially as a result of the pandemic in many places in government and in governance. This is the data from last night. Joe Biden is now more unpopular than he is popular with a higher disapproval rate than he has an approval rate in large part because of the response to the pandemic. This is the data I picked up from Chile recently. I don't know if the election has changed everything, but the lack of trust we see extends not only to government, but actually to democracy itself, which is perhaps even more worrisome. And in Europe, we see similar trends as the pandemic enters another year, there is declining trust in government and government response. This is, however, not new to the pandemic. This decline in trust has been happening over the course of a generation. And we see systemic longitudinal trends towards lack of trust in government in the United States, as in Latin America, uh, 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 as a significant factor of public life right now. Now, again, many people may argue, as my colleague Paul Light does, this is a graph from NYU professor Paul Light, who writes about the concept of government breakdown. And he says that we have in every era, but increasingly today, seen breakdowns of governance, the inability of government to respond effectively to crisis, most notably under the Trump administration, that's the very large blue line, but also under the Biden administration today with such problems as the withdrawal from Afghanistan, as well as the response to the coronavirus pandemic. But I think this is too easy. This story of government failure, of government ineptitude, of governance deficits is really only part of the story. And what we also saw during the pandemic, though we talked about it a lot less and the media covered it a lot less, were significant instances of success by governments really doing things right. So all of us looked to New Zealand during the pandemic, for example, for its really very agile and effective response to the pandemic and now to the vaccination process, where they have been very agile, very rapid in their response, but also very creative in how they've done things. Our Veterans Administration, always known as a place of tremendous failure where we're unable to deliver effective services to veterans, has actually been one of the unsung heroes of the last few years using new technology and better data and more agile ways of working to fundamentally transform how services are delivered to veterans. And by uh, responding in the pandemic, by essentially throwing the rules out the window 
and being able to actually hire people, especially nurses and doctors, very rapidly to ensure a very effective response. Even the UK, where they have taken so much criticism for failures during the pandemic, has been able to do some things right. They were able to stand up seven very rapid response hospitals. More hospitals, it turned out, than they actually needed in this case, but it allowed them to be prepared to respond to the worst of the disasters. In my own work in the state of New Jersey, in response to the pandemic Bart, back in March 2020, we stood up this website, covid19.nj.gov, to provide a single place from which people could get responses to the crisis of the pandemic, to get their questions answered about whether your child's school is open or how do I get a test or what should I do in the event of the pandemic. We stood this site up in three days. And we did that by partnering with the public sector. And then I think importantly, using the data from what people were calling in, we had a hotline and people would call in with questions. And we use that data and from their search request to the website to decide what information to put on top front and center for people. We also collaborated with an NGO called the Federation of American Scientists to create a website called Ask a Scientist. And you could type in your question here and get a response from a crowdsourced network of 600 PhD level scientists. So if you wanted to know, should I uh, drink bleach or should I wash my counters with vodka? You could actually get an answer from a scientist. And we used that service to build into this website so that when you type in a science question, you were getting a question from a PhD, a response from a PhD scientist. And when you typed in a question about state services, like could I open my restaurant or um, where do I donate my ventilator, you would get a response from the state. There are lots of these examples, Vietnam being a notable one, where again, they've had tremendous success at actually responding to the virus. So what I want to point out here is that these examples really reflect a new and a different way of working, a way of working that we have seen proven out during the pandemic to succeed, but that is not the standard way of working in government. It is, as Eduardo referred to, very much reliant on better uses of data, data analytical thinking to be able to spot and understand problems and to understand, therefore, what kinds of solutions we need. But it's not only about data. It's also about using the skills of what some people call human-centric design, others call collective intelligence. In other words, it's how we get smart from people as well as how we get smart from data that together, the quantitative and the qualitative, that really give us a new kind of toolkit, uh, the kind of skills that we really have seen in evidence that allow us to solve problems in new and more agile ways. So there's a number of these core skills. I'm not going to talk about all of them today in the interest of time, but I want to just go through a few of what these skills are of what Eleanor Ostrom, the Nobel Prize winning economist, referred to as the public entrepreneur. She put forward first this notion that entrepreneurialism, that creativity and agility and a successful leadership doesn't only come from the private sector, it can also come from the public sector. And we saw lots of evidence of that during the pandemic. We're reading here, of course, about the fourth vaccine that you're giving in Chile. And we're excited about the entrepreneurial spirit that something like that uh, which is the envy of many of us here, uh, really does display. These are skills that are not just, however, about coming up with creative ideas, as we think about with the private sector entrepreneur. It's not just about the new invention. It's really about innovation, which is inno invention implemented in practice. It's not enough to invent a vaccine. We actually have to put shots in arms and that is where public entrepreneurship comes in, the ability to be able to define 
and solve problems and implement solutions on the ground, which requires these new ways of working. So let me quickly go through some examples that both from COVID and what's predated to really illustrate what these skills look like in practice. The first and the most underrated skill, I would say, and one in which data plays an extraordinarily important role, is the ability to define a problem. Not to start as we typically do in government with the solution. Here's the law, here's the regulation, here's the app or the website we're going to create but to really start by trying to under, understand a problem as it's happening on the ground so that we can design policies and services that are responsive. A few months ago during the pandemic, uh, I helped to run a project together with the Department of Education in New Jersey, where we use new technology to reach out to 20,000 students, parents, and teachers to be able to understand what they thought the challenges were with their child's education during the pandemic. So that we would be designing policy responses that responded to what people actually are concerned about and what they see as being a priority. Tomorrow I have a workshop with the city of Oakland, California, where we're going to talk with civic leaders about what the problems are that people are facing in the city, according to them not just according to the city, but really trying to use human wisdom and human intelligence to better understand what the problem is. But we need to couple that quantitative advice with the, quali sorry, the qualitative advice that we get from people with the learning and wisdom that we can get from data. So in Chicago, for example, they use the data on restaurant inspections. This predates COVID on foodborne illnesses in the city of Chicago to design a new algorithm to make it faster, easier, and I might add cheaper to inspect restaurants. And as a result of using the data about past instances of foodborne illness, they were able to reduce the instances of disease by 25% in one year. The similar kinds of algorithms and uses of big data have been used by people like Professor Daniel Neal, who used to be at Carnegie Mellon, is now at NYU, to tackle the very, very difficult problem of predicting where rats will travel and reduce rat infestation in cities, a very important public health and sanitation problem, by using data sets like uh, uh, sanitation data, complaints about trash, instances of foodborne illness, um, and 25 other data elements that he's combined to develop an algorithm to predict the pattern of rats traveling. But it's very important, again, to combine the qualitative with the quantitative. We've been doing a lot of work in what we call smarter crowdsourcing to bring together the wisdom, not just of ordinary people on the ground, but to also tap into the intelligence from university experts and industry experts from around the world to be able to bring together, as we did very recently, uh, almost 100 people to help the U.S. Congress address the question of how do we get better evidence into the way that we make laws. So instead of hearing from three people, as is typically the case when a legislature has a hearing, we brought together dozens of people from all over the globe to talk about how legislatures are using evidence in new ways, including participants from the Senate in Chile, and from the legislature in Australia um, and all around the world to be able to develop new approaches. Oh, one last example, sorry, of uh, uh, real world people making contributions. Sorry, this, uh, uh, this one out of order, um, but I didn't wanna fail to mention this is another COVID example. Is during the uh, beginning of the pandemic, when we had very little data in the beginning to understand where the virus was traveling, we took a page from the playbook of Kerala, India, which did this first. And in one day, we developed what we call the COVID-19 symptom checker. We asked people to type in, are you having a cough? Do you have a fever? Um, and we were able to give them public health advice. What should you do as a result? But importantly, what they told us gave us the best real-time data that we had to then track where the virus was moving. 
650,000 people use this tool. And as a result of having that data, we were able to develop predictive algorithms and we never ran out of ventilators. We never ran out of PPE. Far too many people still died, but not as a result of a lack of supplies because we could actually get the supplies to the places they were needed ahead of time. So all of that to say, again, the combination of the qualitative and the quantitative, extremely important. Let me give a couple of more examples here, not with regard to defining the problem, but then actually coming up with solutions. In the United States, we have had a website called challenge.gov now for the last 10 years. And federal agencies have put out over a thousand requests for help, challenges, as they're known, desafios, to uh, the public to ask for help solving problems, whether it's designing a next generation space vehicle or coming up with better ways of uh, serving healthy food to children in public schools. We have been relying on uses of new technology for a long time now to be able to tap into that collective wisdom and collective intelligence. You have done something like this similarly, um, a project done by Ciudadano Inteligente, the Abre Project in Peñalolan and other cities, to actually reach out to residents to collaborate on coming up with solutions to urban challenges in the city. But as important as problem def defining the problem is and coming up with solutions, we also need new ways of implementing solutions to challenges again, that take advantage of both people and data to do so. In the city of Lakewood, Colorado, a, na uh, a neighborhood, a suburb outside of Denver of about 100, 150,000 people, they have only one uh, urban planner for the city. So there wasn't much he could do in terms of the fight against climate change and sustainability what he did was instead to create a program called the Sustainable Neighborhoods Program and use new technology and better uses of data to coordinate what has now become 20,000 residents working together on 500 different sustainability projects. So through this kind of collaboration and uses of collective intelligence and engagement, they've been able to do much more than the city would be able to do working by itself. Finally, and last stage here of the process is the ability to then evaluate what's working. Far too often in government, we tick the box and say mission accomplished. Uh, we announce a policy and that's the last we hear of it until maybe three or five years later, someone in a university or a think tank does a study about whether something is working. So there has become a trend across the world in what has sometimes been called social auditing. That is to say, using real-time data and the collaboration of networks of people, there's been an effort to try to speed up and do evaluation in real time uh, across the world in a variety of different projects. So you have been trying this in Chile, not using new technology, but in uh, real space, using focus groups to evaluate the effectiveness of legislation as it's being uh, issued. But there are projects like those of Promise Tracker in Brazil, which looks at and tries to evaluate how uh, um, uh, commitments that the government is making are actually working in real time. There's a wonderful project out of India called MKSS, uh, which has been using social auditing for many years, not in a high-tech context, but by literally reading people, government budgets, in the town square across villages in the state of Rajasthan to get people's help with spotting bridges built to nowhere or dead people who are getting paid by the government to spot corruption and fraud and waste and abuse. Um, and to do so by engaging more people in the process of evaluating what's working and what isn't. But thanks to new technology and greater uses of data, and now the ability to use machine learning to make sense of that data more quickly, these kinds of social auditing projects are really beginning to take off.
But these uses of data and collective intelligence, this 21st century toolkit that I think the pandemic has really shown a light on as being so important, these kinds of skills that we want people inside government and outside government to have in order to solve problems more effectively, these are not skills that we are born with. They are frankly not skills that we even learn when we go to school. But we need to be able to transform our institutions, to be able to create those public entrepreneurs, and to be able to create public institutions that are more adaptive, evidence-based, and collaborative, as I hope all of these examples have shown. Again, more experimental and agile, faster, better uses of data, and better uses of citizen engagement, of human intelligence, of human wisdom, to be able to solve problems more effectively. The best institutions are ones that are experimenting with, you, with adapting and adopting these new skills and making them the way people work in practice. So you see experiments like the Cabinet Offices Society 5.0, or the UAE has its innovation lab, as many uh, governments are beginning to experiment with which is trying to develop these new, more challenge-based ways, uh, ways of working. Even in places like Bangladesh, which we have typically thought about as the developing world, has leapfrogged so far ahead, thanks to uses of data and human-centered design, these new kinds of skills, to make government work better and more effectively for people. But this depends on having a set of skills that is far too often lacking. We have been doing surveys now in five countries. We're working on our sixth country to look at the availability of these skills in government. And it turns out that they're not in widespread use. So even where people understand the value of data, as we all do thanks to the pandemic, it doesn't mean people know how to use these skills in practice. It doesn't mean they know how to engage with residents in new ways or that they know how to use other skills like behavioral insights or to be more agile. But interestingly and fundamentally of great importance is that when people learn these skills, they use them all the time. So I want to close today by arguing that it is extraordinarily important, the fix that we need, the solution for institutionalizing the successful ways of working we saw during the pandemic and that we're still seeing in pockets around the world, is to train people in new ways. In Canada, they have launched a new digital academy where they are providing free training in new ways of working to 250,000 public servants across the public sector. In Germany, just in this last May, they launched their own version of the Digital Academy. And this did, these digital academies aren't just teaching people about tools, like what is data or what is machine learning. They're teaching them how to apply these tools, again, to solve problems in practice. So one of the core courses on the German Digital Academy website is a course they call New Work, and they use the term in English, not in German, to really indicate that this is an innovative 21st century approach to working differently, more agile, more data-driven, more collaborative. In uh, Argentina, not too far away, they have been running the Public Policy Design Academy for quite some years now. It started out teaching just human-centered design and has then come to embrace also the teaching of data. And of course, in Chile, uh, the Universidad Adolfo Ibanez has been running data science courses for people in government for the last four or five years now. So lots of examples, including one that I've been working on myself that we have created in the state of New Jersey and have now developed a version for across all of the United States. We have partners in six states working with us to develop free shared resources around training people to work in new ways. And lastly, I'll just put up one last example. 
which is a free site for learning these skills that we've put up to help people outside of government, not just inside, learn these skills of using technology, data, and community wisdom to be able to design powerful solutions to contemporary problems. So these are skills that all of us can learn to be able to become more agile, more effective at really driving mission-driven change. Why is this so important? It's so important because we have lots of challenges that we're facing. The pandemic is of course front and center for all of us as an urgent problem that we need to tackle. But we also have chronic long-term problems like climate change, uh, racial inequality or uh, inequality for immigrants, or as is paramount in Chile, economic inequality uh, that uh, plagues your society as well as that of the United States. So we have lots of problems we need to solve. And the only way we're going to solve them is if we develop the skills of the public entrepreneur, learning how to use data, learning how to use collective wisdom to be able to tackle problems uh, in the real world and for good. So with that, let me stop and say thank you and thank you to the translators.